Okay, so this is the series entitled Getting to Know You, God. This is lesson three in this uh, kind of short series that we're doing. And the title of this particular lesson is The God Who Knows. The God Who Knows. Uh, I mentioned this before, but uh, in his book, One Holy Hunger, great book, Mike Cope talks about several myths or misconceptions that people have about God. Uh, and that's what we're doing in this series, you know, getting to know you, God, getting to know Him better. Uh, and in this series, we've tried to better understand God and have, you know, we've reviewed a couple of the myths that, uh, that actually hinder our uh, deeper knowledge of and our relationship with God. If we have a wrong idea of who He is, uh, then it's hard for us to have a real relationship because we, we have you know, we have a mistaken idea of who God is. So we've seen that God, for example, is spirit and He only uses human and material images to help us relate to Him. You know, he's not a he, He's not a she, He's not a it. But in order to communicate with us, you know, uh, using human language, human ideas, there's got to be God, He did this and He did that. You see what I'm saying? So He uses those images, those words to uh, help us understand him, but we also understand that he's not really a male, he's not a female, he's not a, an object. And then last week we studied the idea that God's greatness should not be a cause for fear, for panic, but rather an incentive to imitate him. We see God, we see his greatness, we see the qualities that he has, this should inspire us to, to be like Him, not to run away from Him, not to be afraid uh, of Him. And I said also in that lesson that imitating God's holiness is the best way to get to know Him. In other words, if you want to get to know God, the best way to do that is to attempt to imitate Him. And I also said that imitating His holiness required us to do two things. Number one, it required us to go where He is at. And I know that sounded strange. Wait a minute, to go where He is at? Well, I mean, He's, he's, not, a, he's not human. He's a spirit. How can we go where He's at? And we talked about that. I said, well, when you pray, He's there. So go to Him in prayer, because that's where He is. Uh, when you serve others in the name of Christ, He's there. So serve others in the name of Christ because that's where He is. Uh, when you worship Him, He's there. And so go to worship if you want to go where God is and so on and so forth. We gave several, uh, you know, several examples of that. If you, want to, if you want to know God, you have to go where He's at. And then the other way was to act in the way that He acts and that's with, with purity. Um, God is holy. God is pure and all the attempts that we make at living a pure lifestyle, all the attempts that we make to divest ourselves of sin and bad habits and you know, to, to scrape away the barnacles of the world and that, that kind of stick to us as we, as we live in this world, all those attempts to do that is an attempt to imitate God's holiness and if we do this, we get to know Him better. That's the exercise that is required to get to know God better. And actually, this is the reward of spiritual life. What do you think our final reward is? In a lot of religions, you know, the final reward is just a better version of this earth. <laughs> That's the final reward, paradise. Paradise is a better, a better version of this world. You know? In Islam, the Muslims, you know, 72 virgins. You, know, you don't have just one wife, one virgin. No, you've got 72 of them. You know, just a better version of this world. But Christianity doesn't teach that our reward is a better version of this world. Christianity teaches that our reward is that we get to know God perfectly. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you shall know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the reward. That's where we're going to. We go to heaven. What's going to happen there? We are going to know God. I'll give you a small example of that. Just yesterday. 
Yesterday I was uh, in, a, we have a little sunroom in the back of our house, <clears throat> and I was just sitting there reading, and it, you know, if you remember, yesterday it was kind of cloudy, it was kind of gray and a cloudy day, and I was just sitting there, you know, the blinds were open, and it was just gray and cloudy, and if you sit in a sunroom, it's all windows, right? So you're really aware of the day. And then all of a sudden, as I was reading, the clouds broke open and the sun began to shine. You know, you know that feeling, right? And I, and I was reading and I could just feel the warmth of the sun and I looked up and all of a sudden the sky was starting to be blue and there was more light. And in biblical terms, it lifted my countenance. You know what I'm saying? You go, oh, wow. You know, it it kind of lifts you. Okay, here's my thought. If simply the appearance of a material object called the sun that's providing more light is able to lift your spirit, can you imagine what it'll be like when we're in the presence of the light itself, the source of light? If the sunshine can lift your spirits and cheer you, can you imagine what it'll be like to be in the presence of the one who is the source of light? So that's what we're going to. That's where we are going. So getting to know God, every you know, attempt at holiness and purity is an attempt to draw closer to that light. And it is the reward unto itself. Unfortunately, many people, <clears throat> they do those exercises, you know, like, I'm going to be better, I'm going to do this, I'm going to give up this bad habit, blah, 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 because that'll make me saved. And they wonder, why is it that I'm doing all of this stuff, but I don't, I don't feel saved, I just feel burdened. Well, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Divesting oneself of worldly habits and, 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 and straining to, or striving rather, to, to live holy and pure lives the object of that is simply to get to know God better. And that in itself is a reward. And that reward, you know, once you get that reward, you don't want to go back to the world, right? You, you couldn't pay me to go back to the world. Anybody here take money to go back to the world? Deny Christ, forget all of that, go back to the world where you were without a knowledge of God, without anything. Is there any money that, would, that anyone here would receive in order to do that? Well, no. Why? We've gotten a glimpse, we've gotten a taste of God. We can't go back. All of us are like Peter, Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There's nowhere else to go. For good or bad, we're in this thing. And all of this, all of this because we want to know God. All right, so this week we're going to look at another misconception, the idea that God only uh, is watching us in order to zap us, in order to punish us. When I first became a Christian, the one quality of God's personality that really bothered me was His omniscience. You know, the fact that He is all-knowing, He knows everything, so I was happy to know that He was all powerful, could answer my prayers. I was happy to know that He's all good, all wise, because those things could help me in my times of need and trouble. So I was happy about that. All merciful? Yes, absolutely. However, the fact that He knew everything about me, that made me feel kind of uncomfortable. Remember, I'm saying this as a new Christian. I, I was feeling kind of mm, weird about that. You know, he knew what I thought, every thought, he knew what I thought. He knew every little thing that I did, and he also knew why I did it. To the outside world, something I did might have seemed good, but he knew the real motive on the inside, whatever that was, pride or selfishness, or, you know. And he witnessed every word that I thought or I spoke, and everything that I ever did, good or bad, every single thing. And that made me so, oh, I didn't, I didn't like that. It was like someone was watching everything I did in order to make it worse. 
and then judged everything I did. Um, I'll give you another example. Are, are you driving down the street? You're just driving along, you know? And then all of a sudden, behind you, a police car comes behind you while you're driving. And so you know, you're driving along. What's the first thing you do? Well, you look at the speed limit. That's the first thing you do. First time today I've looked at the speed limit signs, right? And so, you're, and actually, you're driving along and between looking at the speed limits and looking in your rear view at the cop, you're not even paying attention to the road anymore. Why? Because you think he's watching you. He may just be on his way home from work or he may be on his way somewhere else. You know what I'm saying? But because he's behind you, every little thing, I'll put my flash, I come to a complete stop, don't I? <laughs> and then put my flasher, and then I make a, you know what I'm saying. We act differently when we're being observed. So that was the, the problem for me. I was being observed for everything. So this idea of not being able to have anything secret and eventually you know, getting zapped for it can make people paranoid and drive them to abandon God if they didn't realize how God sees us as He gazes at our exposed life every day. David, the, you know, David the psalmist, the king, David explored this idea of nakedness before God in Psalm 139. And he came to a comforting and encouraging observation as he examined the one who was examining him. And what's interesting about this particular psalm is that David goes from being closed to God and running away from Him, not liking the constant scrutiny, he goes from that to being fully open and inviting God completely into his life. So go to Psalm 139 and we're going to go over this psalm to examine that phenomenon of God continually with us and how that, <clears throat> how that affects a person. Psalm 139, verse one, he says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. So what David does at the very beginning, very first verse, is he declares the end of the matter in the very first verse, which you know, this was the style of writing of the day, to begin with a conclusion and then follow this with explanations contrary to how we do things today. Today we, we put in an introduction, we state what the problem is, you know, we give you know, arguments or descriptions, blah, 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 and then in the summary we summarize. So therefore we summarize. Well, this particular psalm begins with the summary statement and then goes on to explain the details. All right? So he says that God has searched him and known him. Searched. God does His searching through the Holy Spirit. That's how God has searched Him, through His Spirit. Romans 8, 26 and 7. And He says God has known Him. Known Him not casually. This, this penetrating look into our spirits by the all-wise Holy Spirit produces not just a, a casual acquaintanceship or a general idea of who we are, but rather a deep and intimate knowledge of us right down to our very core. He searches us and He, he knows us. So in the following verses, David explains the results of such knowledge. And the results of such knowledge is that you cannot hide from God. You are naked before Him. So this is where he begins from. He begins from the idea you cannot hide from God and because of that you are afraid. And so let's look at verse two. He says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. So he said, God is aware of us while we rest. He's aware of what we're thinking. Verse three. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. So God knows what we do, you know, my ways, and where we go. 
And not only where we go physically, you know, I'm going to New York, I'm going to Dallas, but he knows where we go up here. Where do we go up here? Where does our mind go? Where does the, 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 the focus of our mind, where does that travel? Verse four, even before there is a, world, a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. In other words, God even knows what we're going to say before we even say it. Verse five and six, you have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Oh, remember I said that it was bugging me at the beginning because God was everywhere. I mean, I couldn't have a moment to myself. That's, that's how he describes that. Your hand is on top of me. You're, I feel your presence. It's a burden. It's a weight. So God is above and God is below and God is behind a person. The intensity of this type of presence is too much for the writer here to grasp. More than he can, more than he can handle. And so we go to verse seven to 12. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in shell, behold, you are there. If I take wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even in the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So now he tries to imagine a place or a condition where he could actually get away from God, even if he tried. And his conclusion is that even the best hiding place, and the best hiding place, his conclusion is the darkness, even his best hiding place, the darkness, cannot conceal him because God is light and where he is, there is no darkness. So the author now realizes that he is, he's naked before God. He can't run away. He can't hide. He cannot lie to Him. And so in the verses, in these verses, instead of being uncomfortable or frightened, he begins to appreciate this special quality that God has. In other words, he goes from you know, wanting to hide and being afraid to the next level, and the next level is, well, maybe this is not such a bad thing, you know, that God is everywhere, that He knows me totally. Maybe that's not such a bad thing. So let's read verse 13 to 16. He says, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Many people who defend you know, pro-life and so on and so forth often use this very passage here to demonstrate you know, they say, what does it say in the Bible that you know, life begins at conception? Well, here, <laughs> here, where God says, I knew you from the moment you existed, I knew you. I knew you when you were just substance. I knew you from the beginning. I knew you in the womb where you were starting to be formed. You know, in those days, obviously, science had not discovered molecules and this and that, you know, the, the, the language had not evolved or developed. But in a poetic way, he's saying, I saw you as you were being conceived and formed and developed and slowly, you know, yeah. So David realizes that it is this powerful knowledge that was at work in creating him. And he recognizes that everything that exists does so because of God's knowledge and therefore can rejoice in everything. I can rejoice in seeing the sun, as I said the other day, lift my, lift my spirits. That's not, that's not worship. That's not you know, sun worship. That's not paganism. That's, I appreciate what God has done. 
and how it affects me in a positive way, because He created the sun. And He created the sun with the knowledge that the sun would give men this joy. Not to be worshiped, but to be appreciated. He also recognizes that God knew from the beginning what David's life would be and where his life would end. And this brings him comfort because God is with you at birth and He's with you at death. So you're never alone. You know, the great fear that people have is to they don't want to die alone. That's why family gathers and they want to be around the sick person. You know, they want to be there. And as I've mentioned before, sometimes someone step out of the room just to get a drink of water or something like that and they'll come back and say, oh, you missed it. Grandpa passed. Oh, I wanted to be there. I didn't want him to be alone. Well, he wasn't alone. <laughs> Especially Christians, we're not alone. When we die, the Lord is with us. So he goes from, I want to hide, to, well, I guess this isn't so bad, to, I praise God because He knows so much. So in verse 17 and 18 he says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. I love that verse. I love that verse. When I am awake, I am still with you. What does that mean? It means that when I am asleep, I am still with you. Imagine a God that is with you while you sleep and there as you awake. So David moves from appreciation to praise for this great knowledge that made his life possible and knows about his future life as well. So he's moved from discomfort at having someone surround him with knowledge to appreciation of that knowledge to praise for such great knowledge, and now to the final stage, prayer and confidence based on that knowledge. So in 19, uh, verse 19 to 22, let's read that. He says, O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, depart from me therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. So he goes from praising God for this knowledge to relying on this full knowledge and rejecting the darkness that he once was hiding in. You know, at the beginning, he wanted to go and hide in the darkness, get away from God. Now at the very end, he rejects the darkness and says, no, I, I want to stay in the light. I want to stay in the knowledge of God. So David, confident that God knows him and how he feels, asks God to destroy his enemies. The idea not expressed here is that the enemies don't know God and they refuse to acknowledge or be known by him. Therefore, they deserved to be punished. So he's become an advocate of God, an advocate of having God know all of us. Verse 23 and 24, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. And so the final stage, the final stage is he asks God to completely know him. Full surrender. He starts with, I want to hide out and I want a piece of my life that you don't see, God. He starts there and he ends at, here I am, Lord. Know me completely. Take me completely. 
I'm yours. So the final and beautiful expression of his submission to God is seen here. Before he looked for ways to hide, places that could be kept secret, but once he realizes that God's knowledge has always been there to create and preserve and protect, he opens his heart and he invites God to search and to know and to examine him deeply. Now he wants God's knowledge to heal him of his anxieties and sinfulness and his infidelities. You know, wanting to hide in the darkness, what is that? Well, that's just wanting to hang on to our sinfulness, right? The light came into the world and men did not come to the light. Why, Jesus says? Well, because the men love the darkness. They love their sin. And so you know, that's, that's, that's the problem all the time. We love sin more than we love the Lord. So his final plea is for God to take him by the hand because now he is no longer afraid. Take him by the hand and lead him to heaven. Full confidence. I am not afraid that whatever you take away from me, Lord, whatever you purify me of, whatever you purge out of my life will actually be good for me because you know best for me. Lead me by the hand. Wonderful, beautiful, comforting song. So you, know, you read one of these things um, and it makes you just ask. You, know, you, you walk away asking, wow, where am I in the process of being known by God? Because this, 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 uh, this process that David talks about, it's, it's all of us go through this. You know, are we still trying to hide things? living a double life, pretending that you know, God may not see or care about the secret things in our lives. I mean, hopefully we've moved away from this kind of immature stage of development and we've arrived at the point in our lives where we can rejoice and praise and have confidence in God because, because God knows how we feel and why we feel this way. You know, God is the perfect judge because He knows why we do things. He knows things about why we do things that we don't even know. <laughs> you know, we do stuff and we don't know why we do them. The, the source of it is way back there hidden under a rock somewhere in our past or in our subconscious, but He knows why we do things. That's why He gets to judge and not us. He knows what we need. He knows when to act. I mean, if it was up to us, we'd want action when? Uh, now. <laughs> when do I want action on this thing? Now. When do I want to be healed of this thing? Uh, now. When do I want this good thing to start? Uh, now. For us, it's always right away. But God is the one who knows when to act. He's the one uh, to know uh, how to solve our problems. He's the one who knows who we really are. And here's the kicker. He knows who we really are and He still loves us. You know, people are guarded in relationships and usually the reason they're guarded in relationships is because they're afraid that if people knew who they really were, they wouldn't like them. The great confidence we have with God is He knows who we really are and He loves us despite that. That's a great, great comfort. So I pray you know, that, that we can all see that where we need to be as we press on in Christian maturity is that point where we not only know that God knows us, but we consciously invite God in and we invite Him in to examine us in every way. I don't know if that's ever a prayer that we make. Dear Father, please examine me fully. Examine me completely, Lord. Reveal to me who I really am. Help me in that way. We invite Him to heal us 
of our sins and our weaknesses. We always want Him to heal us of our sore back or migraine headaches or you know, cancer. We, and of course, why, of course, we pray for that. But do we also pray that He heals us from our sins? That's a prayer. Invite Him to discipline us like sons and daughters. We ever pray that prayer? Lord, please discipline me. I'm out of control. Help me get back into my right mind. Invite Him to change us for the better. To fill us with His love and His Son. To use us in His service. To help us to know Him in the way that He knows us. Remember, the end game, remember what I said at the very beginning of this lesson, the end game of Christianity is that we get to a position where we raise from the dead, we're equipped with a glorified body, and that glorified body enables us to have a relationship with God without reference to sin. Right now, the relationship we have with God is through the cross. It's always in relationship to sin. We're the forgiven ones, we're the saved ones. We're the ones that have His grace because we need grace because we're still sinners. But there'll come a time when we'll have a new body, a glorified body, and we'll have a relationship with God without reference to our sins anymore. No more the cross. So someone will say, well then what, what, what will be the substance of our relationship if it isn't in reference to the cross or to sin? Well, the substance of the relationship will be knowledge. My relationship with God will be to know Him, and since there's no end to Him, then there's the eternity part. There's the bliss. If I felt lifted when the sun began to shine for a moment, Imagine that lifting sensation just continuing and continuing and continuing and continuing. There's only one word for that, bliss. That's what we're heading towards. And we get a taste of that when we invite God in to examine us and heal us and discipline us and so on and so forth, so that we can live a holier life, that we can be like Him. So this total submission to the scrutiny of God is the final stage of our development in Christian maturity. So wherever we are in this process of being known by God, remember that He wants to know us so that He can take us by the hand in the same way and lead us home. So we need to remember and ask ourselves, are we ready to let Him into our heart and every secret place? He is always ready and He is always willing to enter in and to lead us. Usually we're the ones that are you know, closing the door. We're the ones trying to hide out in the darkness. All right, so there's our lesson number three on the God who knows. Thank you very much for your attention.